Hi everyone, my name is Martin. I'm doing a PhD uh, here at Masary University of Bologna, which is not this university but the other one. Uh, and I'm going to present you uh, a research that we did on my PhD on Lambda.com. Actually, there was a booth. Maybe you've uh, attended the booth yourself, maybe not. I'll ask later on. Uh, it's a PhD cooperation with Red Hat Czech. Uh, and it will revolve mostly around TLS certificates, certificate validation, error messages, and stuff like that. But before we dive into TLS uh, and into the uh, hardcore developer star or stuff, or stuff like that, uh, let's step one or two steps sooner to see why we are going there and uh, how we came to get that thing. And for that, uh, we'll go to Hawaii first. So imagine you are, at, you are in Hawaii. It's the 13th of January 2018. You may know the date. Uh, you're enjoying your day at the beach. The sun is nice. Uh, the sea is warm. And suddenly, 8:03 in the morning, a text comes. And the text says, "Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter." This is not a drill. And then things start to happen. For 38 minutes, something happened. I don't really know what happened, whether it was panic, havoc, or just a peaceful contemplation on the Hawaiian beach. But then, after the 38 minutes, by some means you probably learned out that uh, missile alert is in error and there is no threat. And basically what happened, uh, the, the guy that was in charge of doing the test, or the drill alert for the whole Hawaiian archipelago, uh, then they just, well, misclicked and issued an, uh, a live alert for the whole island. You may blame the guy for being careless, but uh, after pressure from the public, uh, it was suddenly revealed what the user interface of the software looked like. And it looked something like this. Uh, the guy selected the uh, ECOM state only, which is the live red alert, while he was supposed to go for a drill Beckham demo state only in, the, in a combo box somewhere in the system initiating all sorts of alerts and errors. Uh, and this simple mystery caused everyone at the, at the island to get the text, all the, mess, all the uh, traffic signs, everything, just the shift uh, to get the alert. And now, uh, you may say, yes, this is a problem of a bad user interface. This is nothing to do with security. And I claim that this talk is going to be about security. Uh, so let's move a bit, uh, one step closer to security. Let's look at encrypted email. Uh, there's a very known paper, at least in academia, that's quite old from 1999, uh, and it's called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. Uh, as a bunch of academia guys decided to do a usability study on the PGP at the point, because PGP 5 looked something like this. The old review may still remember, or maybe you can use it. The study basically shows that out of the, uh, I think, 20 people were recruited from the university, but not IT related, uh, about three of them were able to send a PGP signed email when given an hour of time. Uh, and out of the rest, about half managed to send their private key by the email that they sent. Uh, about a third of them managed to upload everything online, both <laughs> private and public parts. Uh, and mostly, uh, most of them had trouble understanding that they need to encrypt with the key of the recipient, not the key of their own. Uh, basically, a usability failure from PGP 509. Uh, sorry, 500. Uh, then, uh, hopefully, the world moved on. Uh, so in, two, in 2006, someone did another study, now starting the tradition in academia of the Johnny Count articles. There are articles about Johnny Count doing all sorts of things, and PGP9 combined with Outlook Express uh, basically did not uh, get any better results than the previous ones. Still a bit later on, the, move, the world still hasn't moved on, uh, because in 2015, Mailbell, which is a plugin for browsers, doing PGP, basically still has the same usability flaws and people are still kind of unable to send signed uh, or an, and or encrypted email. Uh, it's not just the academia, kind of everyone know that, knows that on the internet and we are not even pretending that PGP or encrypted email as a thing as it's implemented now is particularly useful. But still, uh, this is only the end users that are not, uh, not necessarily IT educated and are not working in IT. So it's kind of expectable that they may sometimes screw up the security. Uh, 
But I dare say this is not uh, the only area of people having such problems. So let's finally move to the TLS and uh, to the certificate stuff. So imagine you need to validate a certificate. Uh, you call for OpenSSL, uh, you found the appropriate subcommand and the uh, command line argument, and you get an error message that looks something like this. Well, uh, you see the details of the certificate, and then it clearly states that error 47 happened at the zero depth uh, of the lookup, and that a permitted subtree is violated, whatever that means. I mean, uh, I know some of you in the room, so I know that some of you in the room are perfectly aware of, of what this means and what are all the intricate details, but are this, uh, I dare say there are people amongst you who have no idea what kind of a subtree is there and why it's permitted, uh, but it's been violated, but it's permitted, so it's okay, isn't it? And now I'm st kind of starting to go into quotes that uh, people reacted when we showed them this error message. Uh, the first option that you can have when you run into an error message like this, well, do a pop-up for the end user because they are trying to connect somewhere so they probably know what they are, what they are trying to do. It's not that much of your problem. Uh, you delegate the security decision to the end user. This, well, works uh, from your, your point of view because you get the problem dealt with. Uh, but I would argue that you should go for the second solution which is investigating yourself, trying to understand what's the problem and trying to either do the security decision yourself because you are much more, more capable and much more knowledgeable in the area than the potential end user uh, or at least recommend an action for the end user that uh, they should take and not just ask them whatever you think about the particular error. The problem with solution two is that there are many possible errors that can happen uh, when we are only validating certificates, not speaking about other security stuff that you would be able to do. Uh, this is a list from OpenSSL. It's not uh, full, it continues below. Down there, uh, there's roughly about 80 errors only related to validating certificates uh, in OpenSSL. Uh, which brings us to actually stating the problem. So we were interested, how do people in IT, mostly employed in IT, educated in IT, perceive certificate flaws? Uh, do they understand what caused these flaws or what is the actual point of the error? Uh, do they see the security consequences that the particular error might, might have? Do they know whether the error is serious or less serious? Uh, what further complicates the matter is that sometimes uh, invalid certificates, for example in TLS, are deployed deliberately and when you even contact the admins of the servers, they uh, say you, well, uh, it was too difficult to obtain a real certificate so I just, I just did self-signed or it's just for a testing purpose and nobody should see the server but you know it has a public IP so people kind of start and learn uh, accessing it and using it for if it's some sort of a service. Uh, or it, mostly in the past they were just unwilling to pay a certificate authority for a certificate because Let's Encrypt wasn't that common or didn't exist at all. A second part of the problem, uh, of, or what we were interested in, is uh, how do error messages themselves influence slash help uh, slash worsen the comprehension of the problem? Uh, do they actually measure? If we change the single line errors that happen when you validate a certificate, does that change anything? Or, or is it really out of the scope and it just says it's an error and you Google the error anyway? Well, to investigate these things, uh, we did, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, at an experiment here at DEF CONF last year. We did a booth, uh, back there you might remember, we had stands of IT jokes trying to lure people in to stop by, uh, get interested so that we can convince them to participate in the experiment. Now a brief question, uh, any of you in the room participated in the experiment last year? Hands up please, so that I have a rough estimate. So four, which means mostly not. Uh, I guess the four then came to see the results or to, came to see what the other people uh, thought about the same problems. So when people stopped by and went for the experiment, the task was as follows. You're here at DEF CONF and imagine that you'd love to register for DEF CONF, signing it with Google or Facebook or your Microsoft account that surely everybody has here. Uh, and since it's an open source conference, you decided to help the conference yourself to fulfill the dream of yours uh, and you started to write a patch. Uh, you, you wrote a, a sort of small testing program for the beginning to try connection to the different servers of the identity providers to find out whether the connection works. 
and you find out that it doesn't because some of the providers, servers, uh, have certificates that don't, that don't validate at some point. So you get an error, for example, the uh, already mentioned permitted subtree violation error. Uh, so this was the setup. And what we did was uh, we asked the people to try to understand what the problem is and what the associated risks are, uh, doing whatever they would do if they were if they, this is, was a, if this was a real case at their work. So googling, uh, reading tutorials, reading manual pages, using local tools. The only prohibited thing was talking to other people. Uh, then asking uh, how much would you trust a server with such a certificate or with a certificate with such a problem. Uh, and then later on at the end of the tasks, there was an interview report uh, when we let them describe in their own words uh, what was the problem with the certificate and what were the associate, associated risks as they understood them or as they perceived them. In this way, we talked to 75 uh, developers here at DEF CONF, which took quite a bit of time, uh, but was definitely worth it. Uh, of the 75 participants, sometimes on the slides I'll use the small pawn symbols not to write participants everywhere because it's uh, sometimes rather long. Uh, 67 of which uh, consented with, with having the interview at the end recorded. Uh, so some of the things that I'll be presented only comes from the, seven, uh, from the 67 uh, participant sample, not the full sample. Uh, the vast majority were employed in IT, usually more than just a couple of years, the median was eight. Uh, only two thirds of those, uh, well, of all of them, uh, had formal education in IT, which meant uh, a university degree, bachelor's, master's, or, or postgraduate. Actually, there were about two postgraduates uh, in IT taking part in the experiment. And uh, most of them used OpenSSL as a tool before. I specifically mention OpenSSL because the error messages that we used uh, were copy-pasted uh, from the current Fedora OpenSSL version, which was, I think, 110 uh, FIPS validated. Uh, we also used for some other tools just to be sure how much people handle certificates in other areas. Uh, and not the, the number wasn't as, as great as OpenSSL, but they used uh, the network security services, Java tools, GNU TLS, and with the lower percentages, also some other tools. Now, the first part of the results. Uh, what perceptions do people in IT have uh, with respect to certificate flaws? Uh, I'll go one by one with the five cases or the five certificate errors that we had. And for each of them, I'll discuss what were the main topics or the themes that uh, repeated in between the, 20, the 75 participants. So the first case, kind of a baseline case, was a GitHub or a pretending to be a GitHub certificate. Uh, that was okay. Well, this is the literal uh, OpenSSL error or a message actually uh, that you get uh, when it validates correctly when you do the OpenSSL verify, the standard one without any extra checks. Uh, by far the most, this is from the uh, reco recorded interviews, so 70, 67 is uh, all of them. Uh, almost everyone mentioned that uh, there, there isn't a problem that the certificate is good and or it's okay. Uh, it's not 100% because the interviews were unprompted. We didn't ask precise questions like, do you think there's no problem with the certificate? Yes or no? Because that would be rather leading uh, the people to tell us something that we wanted to hear. So we prodded them uh, until they were satisfied with everything what they said, uh, and then we made thematic analysis out of that. I mean, this is not surprising because there was literally nothing wrong with the certificate. 13 people mentioned uh, that they decided to do an, some kind of an extra check themselves, like saying, oh, I looked into the CERD and couldn't find anything wrong, so I could probably trust it. Sometimes they, 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 uh, they uh, examined the validity, sometimes the issuers, it depends. Uh, and then last notable group uh, is people mentioning that they trust the certificate, but just on the assumption that the program that they are using to do the connection with the server is bug free. Since we provided them the program to do the uh, connection establishment because it would be too long to ask them to code that, uh, we also asked them in the task to presume that the code itself is bug free uh, because otherwise people tend to open the code and look for bugs first and only then uh, inspect the certificate and we were much more interested in the certificate. So uh, this is a rough idea of what it will look like when talking about the cases. 
The second case is expired. It was a Microsoft certificate. It has been expired for seven days by the time. Uh, this is an error message that OpenSSL gives you. Now I'd like to give you a couple of seconds uh, to think of what are the uh, thoughts and asso associations of yours to, uh, to, an explained certi to an expired certificate. If you were to describe to a friend of yours who has never seen expired certificate before, uh, what are the things that you would tell them? And now basically shout them out. I'll try to collect them. What is important about expired certificates? Let's give it a try. For how long they have been expired? Or yeah, it might match or it might not. Anything else comes to mind? Sure. The hmm? local time settings are okay. If the local time settings are okay, that's a nice bit. <coughs> Do you find it common? Does it happen on the uh, on the internet, or is it a rather rare case? I, I, I see rather different opinions here. Someone uh, sh shake their head that it's not common. Some, someone said that it's common. Yeah, What's, who's the issue? So checking who's the issue might be the case because it happens all the time for less encrypt. One, one thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it depends. Uh, it, it kind of is common, but it is usually not common that the server is still operating and this is the certificate that you are served when you connect to the server. Uh, so as expected, the most common answer was basically saying that it's out of date because it's uh, literally what the problem is, and the problem is not that difficult to comprehend here. Uh, then uh, 27 people, nearly half, mentioned that this is probably just some kind of a mistake, uh, or negligence, or operator error, or just somebody just forgotten and they are about to do it, they are about to re renew it, or something like that. Uh, which basically uh, hints that they didn't consider it that much of a problem, and didn't think it's probably attack, though I assume, I uh, admit that this is interpretation. The third one, uh, the third most common theme was that it's common. It, uh, f from what they can see on the internet, uh, or uh, have, giving examples that it happened here and there uh, at that time or this time. Uh, the other theme was that it was okay before, and now it's not okay. So uh, they expressed that it had the certification guarantees that a certificate should give you, but not anymore. Uh, and then they mentioned uh, a rep the thing regarding the issuee or the subject of the certificate, because if it was a small, a small business from my local neighborhood, I would probably trust it anyway. But since it's Microsoft, uh, because the task well said it's a Microsoft identity provider server, they don't trust it much. So that the subject mattered uh, regarding what uh, subject mattered uh, in what trust they gave an expired certificate. The last thing mentioned is that eight people mentioned that it actually might be an attack because we can't guarantee that this is not a stolen previously valid certificate that has been revoked or something like that. Um, I just want to say one more thing. Sometimes I mark the codes with an asterisk. Uh, those are the codes that uh, I kind of see as uh, hinting at understanding of the actual technical problem, what, what uh, there is, uh, not the assumptions or the external experience or stuff like that. Uh, it's not that interesting here. It'll be interesting in a different case. The third case was a self-signed certificate. Again, we see the standard OpenSSL message. So what comes to mind when you uh, get a self-signed certificate? What would you tell to other people? Not trusted. Not trusted, okay. Anything else? For test purposes. Just for test purposes, nice. Uh, didn't hear, hear the beginning? Problems with authentication with the web portal. Okay, there's some problem with the authentication, kind of uh, coincide with the, well, do not trust that. Anything else? Possibly a man in the middle attack. Uh, we're kind of browsing around the what's actually the problem because uh, people mentioned that it's signed by itself uh, and there's no certificate authority and stuff like that. We'll see in a moment. Uh, basically saying that it's signed by itself or some variation of this was the most common theme. Uh, then saying that there's no certificate authority or an official authority that would have signed this certificate, uh, which are both uh, uh, actually saying that they kind of understood uh, what, what kind of a certificate that is. 
Uh, the other thing that they mention is that, well, anyone can create a signed certificate. They often explicitly said, uh, including themselves, and that it's a certificate they could have created themselves. Uh, so basically, no trust could be given in those. Uh, then people mentioned that if this is expected, uh, then they could, would consider it trustworthy. Because there are pages uh, that have the self-signed certificates that they trust, but it's usually uh, their own local server or a local server of their friends or their library or whoever else where they know that there's such a certificate or someone told them or they are kind of expecting a certificate of this sort to be there. Uh, the same amount of people mentioned that uh, it's usually used either uh, by internal purpose, for internal purposes only, so such a certificate should not be got when you're connecting to a public server, uh, or for testing purposes, which I think, uh, no, uh, I, have, I don't have the testing as a separate point. Uh, the last, uh, but not least, is uh, saying that it might be an attack. Again, it's not uh, that prominent, uh, but eight people, which is roughly 10%, mentioned that. Now I want to highlight here that in the most common teams uh, there's not the common uh, tag that would say that people think that self-signed certificates are common, uh, which are, they say, if we asked five years ago or ten years ago, that might have been the case more, but today's the world of Let's Encrypt, uh, this doesn't happen and people don't consider it common anymore, which I think is a very nice uh, outcome that Let's Encrypt has uh, came with. Uh, there will be still some more cases, but breathe out, we are halfway through the cases, there will be two more, uh, so let's dive into them. Uh, the fourth uh, was a host name is match. Uh, the identity provider was Facebook, you were connecting to oauth.facebook.com, but, but the certificate uh, was issued for oauth.facebook.com, so there was an extra S uh, in the name. Uh, the error message doesn't give you the details, but you can still look into the certificates, uh, as many people did. Uh, again, the most uh, mentioned was that uh, the name is bad uh, because the certificate was issued for a different host name, which is uh, literally a very nice description of what the problem actually is. Uh, only about half of the people mentioned uh, that they did, they mentioned the, the other name, which means that they must have looked into the certificate uh, and actually saw, okay, this is the difference, there's the extra S. Uh, and sometimes they said it explicitly. A little bit more than 27 people actually did uh, look into the certificate because we have the technical logs of what they were doing as well. Uh, I'll mention that probably on a later slide when we get to resources and their behavior and actions. Then 22 people mentioned that it's probably some kind of a phishing site or some, some attack of the sort. Uh, uh, and each people said that, oh, it's, it's a different domain, but I'd say it's some kind of a typo or something like that, operator negligence error, uh, because there's just a single character uh, redundant in the name. Uh, but uh, compared to other cases, the attack code word was much more prevalent than the mistake code word, which I personally am quite happy with, uh, considering what the error is. The last <coughs> case is the already uh, infamous permitted subtree violation, uh, which is basically now describing what the problem is. If you have a certificate authority that issues the certificate for a sub-authority, but constrains the sub-authority, you're only allowed to issue certificates in these subdomains, or in, basically in this tree, or you're restricted to go for a tree. That's why it's either a permitted subtree or a restricted <coughs> subtree. And then if the sub-authority issues a certificate aus outside of the constraints that it was given by the head authority, the error message is that the uh, Subtrees of domains where the, cert where the endpoint certificate was allowed was violated. So it's basically a name uh, constraints problem. Uh, but the error message nowhere, says nowhere that it concerns the name. The most common code uh, was, which is but only, only about half of the people, uh, that they understand that there is some chain and a certain point in the chain is restricting a, ho a host name to something. So they got the idea that there's some sort of a constraint somewhere. But they were often not able to tell who is setting the constraint and uh, who is the constraint being set on. Uh, 19 people uh, said something that was literally wrong. 
which means, so for example, when I opened the certificate, I found out that one of the authorities was listed as false, but the others were fine. Uh, which handles the basic constraints extension in a certificate, uh, which is uh, for a certificate authority's compulsory fields field that says whether the whether the certificate belongs to a certificate authority, which means true, uh, or not, which means false. And the endpoint certificate for the actual server, not for the CA in the chain of course said that it's not a certificate of a certificate authority and when they opened the certificate they saw a big line saying certificate authority column false uh, which about four people independently found and attributed the error to. The other of the 19 people saying literally wrong things were saying oh the key purposes were said wrong because of the key purpose extension and most often blaming other extensions in the certificate that they found uh, and obviously didn't understand very well because they found an error in those. Then 14 people literally said that they don't know the whole, don't understand the whole thing and they don't know what's the problem. Uh, 10 people mentioned that uh, it's probably an attack or that it's bad. Uh, for example, saying that they would not let Google that they probably have a rogue admin uh, that was a person actually kind of understanding because he knew that it was even worse than the endpoint certificate uh, being hacked or something like that. It was the problem at the sub-authority level because the sub-authority issued something that it was never allowed to do. Uh, then 10 people again understood that it's some kind of a CA problem, uh, saying that the CA was not allowed to sign, uh, sign that, but again they often didn't know the details of who was constraining where and what was the constraint on, but they understood that it's a problem of a CA somewhere or the sub-CA. Uh, and 10 people, they may be overlapping of course, uh, understood that it was the CA setting the constraints for the other CA. 10 people say, uh, said that it's probably a mistake, just an innocent misconfiguration of the kind that happens all the time on the internet. Uh, just like in the previous cases, there usually are people that uh, consider even Facebook for a Facebook server a typo, which I myself consider a rather serious uh, thing, but I'm not the authority to judge. Uh, 10 more people said that when they, are, when they were trying to Google for details on what the permitted subtree violation meant, uh, it was rather hard for them to find documentation because uh, OpenSSL documentation on the error code permitted sub violation says permitted sub violation. Uh, then you Google and those that were able to Google something ended up uh, on a personal blog of some Lithuanian guy uh, who's an IT specialist and wrote a blog about what, per what name constraint extension is good for. Wrapping up the understanding, we move to the second part, which is uh, asking the people whether they trust the servers with the certificates uh, with the errors that I described, the five. We gave them a trust scale to choose from. It was zero to six. They could have chosen one, three, and five as well, but they were on, those were on the numbers. The four that are listed were also given uh, a description, uh, which six of out of six basically means it's totally okay, if it was my bank website, I would be logging in. Four, <laughs> roughly meaning, probably okay, logging it to a library or whatever, but I wouldn't like banks or something like that. Two out of six, probably not logging in on such a website. Zero out of six, uh, totally untrustworthy, I'm going away from this website. Uh, whatever is written on it is not relevant because it's probably uh, spoofed or attacked or whatever else. Uh, now a comprehensive and maybe a little bit intimidating graph. Uh, what it says is the uh, gray bars are zero out of six and then it goes up with the uh, palest blue being six out of six. I'm totally satisfied. What we see that people are mostly totally satisfied with the okay case. No surprise there. Uh, for the host name mismatch, we see that this is the most distrusted case with more than half of the people not trusting it at all and considering uh, it not even trust to read. While for expired self-signed and name constraints, uh, it's somewhat similar. Even if you do the average, it uh, turns out somewhat similar, uh, which I claim uh, well, it's not necessarily a problem per se, but could have been better because the expired certificate uh, had the full guarantees when it was uh, some time ago, when it was still valid, 
but the self-signed certificate basically never did, did give you any guarantees because uh, as some of the participants said, anybody could have created the self-signed certificate. So if it was uh, my decision, I would have much more liked if the self-signed case would, was much more darker. Uh, and similarly for the name constraints, uh, because even though it's debatable whether the problem is that bad or not, it's the problem on a CA or a sub-CA level. Uh, so it's not just the problem on, of the end certificate, which the others are. So this, to me, is a rather bad error because there's trouble with more certificate and on, on a higher level or on an administrative level. Uh, looking into the expired case in more detail, we asked people whether it matters to them how long the certificate is expired. Uh, and we offered them four choices and gave them the scale as well. These are now the averages. So you see that if it, is, if it expired yesterday, uh, it's almost like I would be logging in, but probably not with my bank. Uh, and as the expired date uh, grows, the trust uh, decreases quite a bit. Uh, but this illustrates that, yes, people kind of expect that expired certificates are common or happen sometimes, and then that when the certificate is expired, it's probably not necessarily that bad a case. Moving to the third part of the results, which is, do the error messages actually influence something? Does it matter whether we write something like this or something different? Uh, the idea of how we tested this was that, uh, as I mentioned, there were people getting the OpenSSL error messages, but the other half of the people were getting different error messages with a different piece of documentation that we wrote uh, and gave them to use. Uh, the new error messages were like this. In the OK case, uh, it explicitly say, said that all performed checks passed, uh, kind of hinting that there might be checks that were, that were not performed automatically. For example, uh, check for the revocation status uh, is not done uh, by OpenSSL Verify unless you explicitly ask for. Uh, expired uh, offers an option that it may not yet be valid. Uh, self-signed uh, is a little bit explicit that it's self-signed and not a root. Uh, hostname is match. Uh, is a bit more verbatim in a way describing that the host name does not match the certificate subject name, more driving you towards the names. So when you open the certificate, you kind of know at which part to look if you're unsure. Uh, and the name constraint uh, drops the permitted subtrees and says that it's a name constraints violation problem or that the name violates the constraint set by the CA. Uh, furthermore, apart that the wording was new, uh, we kept the error codes and we also tried experimentally to add a link, uh, OC details over at this website because we are, well, interested ourselves whether the developers would click uh, or would visit the website or would Google or go for uh, official documentation instead because the, the error uh, word usually was uh, the same. The new uh, website with documentation that we created had the five error cases uh, in a rather distinctive uh, yet uh, concise structure uh, with the error code and the full verbatim thing that was displayed in the terminal to match that it actually the section they were looking for, the explanation saying what happened, what's the problem, the security perspectives trying to explain what might be the security consequences and some kind of a next step section, what to check next, whom to contact, who, what would be the right action to do. Uh, what changed when we did the new error messages? For the OK case, people did more extra checks or mentioned that they looked into the certificate, checked this and that, because the, both the error message and the documentation kind of hinted that those checks that were performed passed. Uh, and they sometimes were Googling what checks are actually performed and which are not, whether a revocation status is included automatically or not. For the self-signed, more people thought and expressed the idea that it, it's probably an attack or it might be an attack or it might be wrong as opposed to, let's say, a mistake, uh, which was the same for the name constraints. Uh, other than that, for the name constraints, there, there were considerably less codes indicating that they don't understand the case or they were stating or that they would be stating uh, things that were literally untrue. Uh, for the two cases that I'm not mentioning, uh, no observable significant change. 
When we look into the trust differ differences, the graph being even a bit more intimidating than the previous one, uh, for the self-signed host name is match and name constraints, the trust basically decreased. You can see that the name constraints, the self-signed, and the uh, host name is match case are darker than in the uh, upper bar, uh, which is the most seen in the self-signed column where uh, we got nearly 45% of the people saying that uh, it's not uh, trusted at all and you should not even trust what, what's, in, what's written on the website. Uh, it's probably an effect both of the error message and the documentation which also tried to stress this but as you saw the documentation was rather brief. It was usually a paragraph of the security perspective of two to three lines. We didn't want to write the labels because nobody would read them really. Uh, just briefly, we also measured all sorts of other things at the booth. Uh, name constraints case took longer to process than the other two, kind of expected because the extension is not known that much. Uh, people tend to look at the certificates rather than, than just saying, oh, okay, so I won't look. Or name constraints problem, okay, I don't need to look into the certificates. Actually, they do, which is a nice thing. Almost everybody Googles, not that much a surprise there. Uh, they often use the text code, uh, less often than the formulation with their own words, and even less often copy-paste the verbatim text message. So they like text codes because they realize it's a unique code that is easy to search for, which is great. The link that was offered got clicked rather often. Uh, nearly three quarters of the people that saw the link clicked it uh, or retyped the website to the browser themselves, uh, which gives uh, us, as the developers of the tools, nice opportunity to point users to a useful place that we may know about or the official documentation. And it can be, it can be even more specific than what we did. It could be CX509 errors, uh, hashtag name, the text code, which basically gets you to the uh, sub uh, part of the web page that you want to read right now without Googling, without uh, anything more. Uh, keep calm, there will be no more results. Uh, I've already covered quite a bit, uh, even though there are more details I could have gone into. So, recap. Uh, what we did, we did a study with 75 DEF CONF attendees last year, here. We gave them four certificate errors, uh, half of them open SSL error messages, half of them redesigned error messages and documentation. The self-signed and name constraints may have been, uh, may be overly trusted. Um, I realize that this is up for a discussion and I'm no authority to say uh, which error is more severe than the other, uh, though that's my opinion. Uh, the name constraints extension is not much understood, even among like people literally working in IT attending DEF CONF. Uh, the expired trust depends uh, quite a bit on the time that's elapsed from the point when the certificate got expired. Changing error messages, documentation matters, and links uh, in the er error messages seem to get clicked and uh, propose a way to guide the, uh, the, the user somewhere. So what can we do next with this? Well, short term, uh, when I finish writing the paper in a matter of weeks, I plan to submit a couple of pitches to OpenSSL. We've done a couple of small pitches last year from the uh, two years ago experiment here at DEF CONF. Uh, it'll be mostly like compatibility preserving stuff, like the error messages when I have a formulation that I see that is a bit better, can be reformulated, maybe the error messages. Uh, the documentation for permitted sub violation can say something more than permitted sub violation. Uh, and I know the guys at OpenSSL are happy to get uh, requests of the sort. And then, well, publish and share the results uh, to spark the discussion on uh, how IT people uh, see certificate or perceive certificate flaws, uh, whether people understand name constraints extension, uh, so what would be the consequences if it actually got used much more than it is? Currently, nobody really uses it. Uh, and uh, maybe a bit controversial, discuss whether there should be links in error messages. Uh, in the more long term and maybe a bit more ambitious way, uh, I would like to map error messages for now for certificate validation in different libraries to see if similarly looking errors, like expired, expired or not yet uh, valid in GNU TLS, actually mean completely the same thing, or there are nuanced corner cases that uh, are an error in one and a different error in the other. 
uh, and maybe compare or share the documentation in between the library. Uh, a more long-term and ambitious thing, you may know that uh, in late 2017, Mozilla, or Firefox, uh, Mozilla, Microsoft, Google, W3C, and Samsung decided to merge their uh, browser documentation at a single place, and they created a single shared collaborative uh, place at uh, the Mozilla Developer Network, uh, which is a thing that could be done for the error messages. Uh, if all the libraries were linking to a single place that described the error messages and what the problem with the certificate is, then, well, uh, it wouldn't be the case that developers of every library would have to formulate all the documentations and the explanations themselves, and you may even have some time to test whether the formulations get understood. So this is what I can do next. I would also like to propose what you can do next. Uh, Take your product that you're developing or testing and do read the error messages that it produces to find out whether you understand them first and whether the users of the product or the developers, if it's a tool for developers, understand them. Ideally, go to some users and ask them or show them the error messages and see what they think, whether they get what they are supposed to get or even make a study if you feel like that and have time or budget for that. Uh, and if you like the ideas presented here, well, spread the word. Uh, there will be a paper available soon. Uh, if you want to have it emailed to you, I'll leave here a paper to sign your email in. Uh, share any feedback in person to me or by email. Closing, uh, usable security may still be unusual, as I found out when I was formulating uh, stuff for the paper and for the abstract, because uh, this is a description of the session, and Grammarly complains that usable security is an unusual word pair, and I would probably go for good security or proper security. So it's still not a thing that people would understand as a colloquial term. Which concludes my talk. If you're interested in the research, uh, there's a website with other research of mine. Uh, thanks again for Red Hat to uh, help to cooperating with the PhD of mine, and I'm happy to take questions. Yes. So have you considered that the, like uh, this is this kind of error messages? Like it, it might work on, on IT people, mm -hmm. yeah, but it definitely never will work on. Even if you improve the put links and whatever, it won't work on people who don't care about computers at all. Only using them for completely different stuff. So, uh, and for these, uh, there was the intention, at least at some point, in browsers to basically say that any error is bad and we want to let you on the side. Mm -hmm. So, do you think, like, yeah, I mean, this makes sense for uh, improving situation for system administrators which are not specialized in security and certificates and something like that. But uh, in general, uh, how do, what do you think about this? So, recapping a uh, bit long question. Uh, uh, drawing uh, attention to that this works for error messages uh, towards developers and IT people, uh, but it might not work for end-user error messages or literally people uh, using IT only as users. Uh, and that browsers, uh, and it's true that a lot of research has been done in uh, discussing browser error messages when there are TLS connection problems. Um, and what I'm basically hinting at, which is already going into the answer part, is that it has been investigating quite a bit for the browsers, uh, not much, if at all, for the developers. And the tools or, and the task that I uh, had uh, was aimed only at developers, because if you are uh, an IT layman, so to say, uh, you would never use the tool, so you would never see these, these error messages. Hopefully, if you, if you did, then someone somewhere did a wrong promotion of some sort of a product. Uh, in the browsers, uh, it's true that the research recently has moved uh, towards uh, not letting the user decide that much, or only letting him decide when the problem is not that, not that serious. Firefox, for example, in many of the TLS problems, just prevents you to access the case. Uh, and only if the problems are lesser, then it offers you a way to override with an exception with about five clicks, uh, intentionally making it complicated uh, for you to get through. Uh, though this is the result of a research because in the past, even the Firefox browsers tried to explain what the particular error was, and it was just way too complicated for the layman. 
So I do agree that uh, for the IT layman, uh, deciding yourself as the developer or possibly a security developer is a better option than letting them decide. Uh, that's kind of returning to the example that I had at the beginning, that making a pop-up that there's a problem with the TLS certificate might not be the right option. Sure, it may infuriate some of the users because they are unable to access their friend's server uh, that has a self-signed certificate, um, but I'm not sure if that's not for the better, actually. I'm not sure. That, did it cover the question? Yeah. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. about the key and the okay. And the second question is, uh, is, it, is there any disadvantages of uh, 4K uh, key lens? And mm -hmm. why we should upgrade uh, the certificates from 2K to 4K? So the, if there is a, some advantages or disadvantages. Okay, so the question handled uh, key length in certificates. Uh, and basically it had multiple parts, whether we had uh, something regarding key length in the research of ours, uh, if so, what was it basically, uh, and a separate question if I see any advantages, disadvantages of moving to 4K keys as opposed to 2K keys. Uh, in this particular research, uh, there was no part regarding the keys. In the two years ago, uh, research booth at DEF CON, basically the same style as was this one, uh, there was a part uh, related. Uh, we had developers uh, do two things, validate certificates, which was more similar to this one, and then uh, actually the first part of that, uh, that year's experiment was please do issue a self-signed certificate uh, for user Bob. And this was the high-level task, and they were given the plain command line OpenSSL to do that. Uh, no high-level tools, really. Uh, and there we were interested also in what the key lens are because they weren't prescribed. And if they asked, we would have, to, we would have told them, well, as you see fit. Uh, the interesting part was that of those people that needed to Google how the command actually looks like, the vast majority, even though there were guys that basically did the OpenSSL command uh, from the top of their head, uh, everyone uh, set the key length uh, manually. So there is a nice default and the default is 2K currently, which is uh, not bad, uh, but nobody used the default because when they found a tutorial uh, or a manual page, there was always an example showing you how to set the key length. And they just copy pasted the example and adjusted if they saw fit. Some of them created shorter keys, some of them created longer, longer keys, but nobody really used the default because all the tutorials uh, showed you how not to use the default. So this was kind of a, the tutorial world and the, uh, the documentation world to blame. Uh, I think nobody did uh, shorter keys than 1K. There were only a minority of people doing 1K keys. Uh, the vast majority did 2K keys, and there were a couple of people doing 4K keys manually. Uh, that answers the part of the question regarding our research on key lands. Uh, regarding the usage, uh, I'm not... Uh, administering that many servers or I don't have, I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable to be able to say to you that uh, there, wo there won't be disadvantages of using 4K keys. It's objectively slower uh, and I was told by people I kind of trust that it still is a significant change if we transition to 4K keys completely that things would just slow down and we don't need to do that now. So if it's not security critical, uh, 2K keys is probably okay. But I dare say that there are people in the room more, re more relevant to answer this question uh, than myself. So this, is, this will have to be sufficient. Any other question? Yes? It's uh, another question, it's just a proposal. I've had a slight uh, long term. Uh, yep. I've proposed that the main browsers, like mm -hmm. Google Firefox, have uh, unified the uh, requirements for certificate. Because, for example, we were doing some product and our customer had to issue the certificate for our product. Mm -hmm. And, for example, it works in Chrome, it doesn't work in Firefox. Mm -hmm. So, basically, so the browsers have like unified the need of checks for certificate. Well, 
the browser world is an all sort of other other exciting and interesting place elsewhere. Uh, you, yeah, that would be nice. On the other hand, it, it would be very difficult in such a consortium. And basically, we have the uh, CA slash browser forum to agree these things. So there is a body actually to dis and a place to discuss these things. Uh, but then, if uh, Google decides to push certificate transparency as a security enhancing thing. Uh, they can do it because their uh, product is important enough and even with, if some other uh, browsers disagree, uh, they can kind of push it themselves, uh, which uh, you wouldn't be able to do if they had to agree on everything. So being flexible and advancing faster would be more complicated. Now I don't claim either of the solutions of going together or going as everyone wishes is strictly better than the other, just the world is complicated. There was a, a try at some point to uh, at least standardize the way that warnings and security indicators are presented in browsers, the lock icons, the green bars, and stuff like that. Uh, there is a W3C standard saying what should the interface in browsers have uh, regarding this, uh, but it's not that much adhered to, and I don't think it's really did, did uh, fulfill the aim. So I'm not sure uh, such an agreement in between browsers would work on this field either. Yeah, sorry, we are out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.